Hello to the Woodstock congregation and to each member, each viewer watching this study. Thank you so much for your desire to enhance the quality of your life and enrich the relationship with the Lord that is designed to last throughout all of eternity by his love, mercy, and grace. I'm very thankful to have a part in this great lineup of summer series topics and speakers. I'm eager for the blessing to come to you and to hear back from you of how this lesson has blessed your life. So open up a Bible, grab one nearby. I'll be reading from the King James Version and we will enjoy our study together. I was told to say just a few things about myself first. My name is Michael Ferris, pulpit minister for the Oak Hill Church of Christ in Rome, Georgia. Uh, my grandparents have strong roots in the Ozarks of Arkansas, the Ozark area there. And my preaching father moved to Nashville, Tennessee when I was just a young child. And after growing up during that time, I moved to Florence, Alabama, ultimately to attend the Heritage Christian University. Though I was teaching classes and preaching uh, off the grid and in assistance with my father where he was preaching during the late 90s, um, I was going into the ministry full time in the early hundreds and uh, very thankful for the opportunities that the Lord has blessed me to bless other people. I graduated Heritage in 2010. I married my lovely wife, Terry Ferris, in 2011, and she's a great support for me in the work. I am uh, very thankful for this time that we have together. I know that I do not have as much time as I always want, and that the nature of the, of the uh, ministry, to never have as much time. But with the allotted time that we have, we have a lot of things very worth our time to discuss and study, and I hope that you are blessed immensely. Once I get started, I might speak a little quickly, so let's just jump in. This is lesson number eight, I believe, in the Woodstock's online summer series of 2020. And this series contrasts the works of the flesh and the works of the spirit. And our top, uh, topic tonight, my assigned topic is, of all things to put together, whew, murder and drunkenness. What's our approach going to be on this murder and drunkenness in a way that maybe we can all relate to more than we might wish? Well, let's discuss, as we are also showing the dichotomy between two kingdoms, let's discuss the two kingdoms. This whole series that you're in is designed to effectively demonstrate the stark contrast between the dichotomic nature of the two kingdoms that currently cohabitate this world Yes, illustrated by Jesus' parable of the kingdom. We call it the parable of the wheats and the tares. In Matthew 13, 34, God's righteous omniscience and holiness will sort and sift the two kingdoms upon his return. And since we can uh, be in only one of the two kingdoms, we had better be sure to know which one we are in and to make the right choice to being in his kingdom. We must therefore give studies like this, of all things, our full attention because salvation is essential. And th these are spiritual matters that we will discuss. Uh, these remain, uh, even to this day, there remains two kingdoms that are on this earth at the same time, a kingdom of darkness and a kingdom of light. And even still, this kingdom of darkness, this kingdom of evil, is working diligently and it is growing to uh, enhance its numbers on earth, fighting for the souls of humanity. And it's not stronger than the kingdom of light by any means, but the king of that kingdom of darkness is the hell-destined devil. He is devious, he is playing by no righteous rule, and has no good intent for you. And so what is more scary is he understands human psychology better than we do. Sometimes you think the devil truly is just sitting back and laughing. You get that idea sometimes, don't you? Well, that's why we read the scriptures to see how God sees the world and how we should as well. How effective is he at what he does? The devil, that is. Well, the hard answer is that none of us have proven immune to his techniques. We have all succumbed to his temptations in some form or another. Every human soul grows in time to become accountable by either that first 
ignorantly or certainly arrogantly later rejecting God's will in the face of a temptation, custom design just for you. I don't know when the first sin was, but after that just came another and another and it just kept snowballing. But once we have partaken of that kingdom, we are in legal spiritual trouble. Sin is a rejection of God's way. How serious is sin? Romans 3.23 talks about how all have sinned and have fallen way short of the glory of God. But Romans 6.23 teaches that sin pays you back in a way of relational, spiritual death. Isaiah 59 teaches that sin separates us from the holy God who has to justly deal with sin against his nature. Scripture then is clear that while we are valuable to God... We have no righteousness of our own to make up for or to ever pay God back for the gracious gift that he gave. It's impossible to do that. So praise God for his amazing solution to an otherwise hopeless condition. Those who, um, those who see their condition of being in sin, but then having come to the Lord to receive that mercy and then that salvation that they are to hold on to, they are eager to please the Lord and walk worthily of the calling which they have received, Philippians chapter 2. But the point here is we have all succumbed to partake of that dark kingdom. And legally, spiritually, we are in trouble because we have no righteousness of our own to pay off or to pay back, make up for, other than what was shed at the cross for our sins. Only the righteousness of Christ that needs to be imputed to us by faith. And that is the nature of the kingdom of the heart of those seeking him. And the devil is very effective to hinder that in every way. He wants to have keep people and bring people back into his kingdom. John writes, 1 John 2, 16, about three forms of sin or categories from which all temptation comes. This is enlightening and challenging, very humbling. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. Those three categories can overlap, and sometimes a temptation can include all three. But what is the implication of us saying that we've all succumbed to the devil's temptations in these three categories in light of our subject tonight? Oh, I'm beginning to make connections and deductions here. All possible works of the flesh that are listed here in Galatians and all possible works of the flesh that could be listed are all under these three categories of sin which we've all participated in. So while we may never see ourselves guilty of the, these heinous acts of these, these, these dreadful deeds of murder and drunkenness, we will look through heaven's eyes tonight and may discover that we have partaken of the same sinful attitudes of heart characteristic of those in the kingdom of darkness that lead to uh, behaving in similar ways. So no wonder the Old Testament and the New Testament both sternly command to guard our hearts because it is the wellspring of life, that it is where ultimately either of these kingdoms reside. And we can only be in one or the other. Pharisees thought that they were righteous because of what they were and because of what they were not doing. But their hearts were far from the kingdom of Christ. Why? Because they were rejecting his truth, his teachings, and his power and purpose for their lives. How persistent is the devil to keep people in? Well, let's shift gears a little bit and direct it towards us, those who have exited the kingdom. How persistent is he to bring those people back to that condemned side? There is not a single person, even those in Christ, particularly Christians, who he does not continually craft customized temptations for in each of these three categories every day. And yes, every day by the way we think and certainly by the way we live. Those in Christ appeal to his power and his strength to overcome those temptations and do so more so successfully as we grow mature. Yes, we have that godly sorrow that leads to repentance, continual leaning and following on him, sustains that forgiveness. Yes, sustains that forgiveness as we walk devoted to that narrow path in his light. Even after, even after every stumble and fall. 1 John 1, 7 is a great passage to encourage us when we stumble and fall. But this is the key, the path we pursue, 
The characteristic of God's children is righteousness. The characteristic of those children of the devil in 1 John terms are, well, just unrighteousness, sin. Just like the principle that Jesus taught in Matthew 7, 15 through 20, by their fruits you shall know them. A good tree bears good fruit, bad tree bears bad fruit, and it's worth nothing but to be burned. Attitudes and actions and behaviors and words, deeds, are all a reflection of which kingdom's code book we let our heart follow. Matthew 6.33 is not just a time management principle where you say, I'm going to do God's things first and then my stuff the rest of the day. I put God first. No, it is a kingdom management rule over the heart, letting God's way rule the day in every way of your life. And through the prism of divine scripture tonight, or today, whenever you're watching, through the prism of scripture, we will sharpen a few edges of our spiritual tools and to detect, and to detect the presence of the kingdom of darkness by contrasting it to the kingdom of light in regards to these two works of the flesh. So as we do this, let's ask ourselves, will we choose carnality and all of its consequences? Or will we choose the illuminated path of Christianity for all of its glories? Lesson section one of two, murder of the darkness. Let's turn to 1 John 3. This uh, difference is powerfully illustrated here in this small epistle and very brief epistle. In contrast to the agape love, of course, which we hear a lot about that respects one another and even preferences others' needs to the point that we will sacrificially serve to meet those needs of our neighbor, John wants us to understand that this agape love I just described is... <laughs> is in stark contrast to the hate that defines the kingdom of darkness. He doesn't mince any meat here, and he says, don't be fooled. Let's notice some teachings from 1 John 3, 10 through 16. In this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Okay, so how are they brought to light? How can we see them? How can we detect them? He says, whoever does not practice righteousness... That's not the path that they're pursuing, and it's evident by all that they're doing. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. The direction we're going with this, why show love in the context of murder? We're going to see this very soon. Those who do not have and practice the love of Christ are not in the king, or kingdom of God. They're in the kingdom of darkness. And there is only two, one or the other. Verse 11. For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Verse 12, here it is. Not as Cain. Do not be like Cain, who was of the wicked or evil one, and then murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his works were evil and his brother's righteous. Do not marvel, my brethren, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brother. That's an evident sign of Christian faithfulness and security in Christ. But he who does not love his brother abides in death. Whoever hates, ah, hates his brother is a murderer. Hmm... Murderer. That's our subject of tonight in part, isn't it? The works of the flesh, murder. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Wow. What is the opposite of having Christ's selfless, sacrificially serving agape love? Well, it is simple. It is an inconsiderate, lust-driven, selfish pride that seeks one's own interests, turning everyone else into potential targets of your hate if they obstruct your egocentric plans or if by their behavior expose the evil preference in your heart. Wow. I love reading First John. This is the type of thinking that it inspires in me. 
First uh, John chapter thir- uh, let's see in the gospel account John chapter three verse nineteen the world is obviously already condemned that's why the Lord came to save us but in John three nineteen the world is further condemned because listen to what Jesus said light has come into the world truth and purpose and redemption and righteousness light has come into the world and people loved darkness rather than light good versus evil wow. Why do they love darkness rather than light when light is what we need and it's the only answer to the solution of our darkness? Because their deeds were evil. In other words, that's what they chose. That's the nature that they partake of and that's what they desire to continue to live by. It's ironic. By choice, the kingdom of unrighteousness, which is destined for destruction, rules their hearts. But James chapter 4 says or teaches that this evil self-seeking spirit is the foundation for all wars and fights among people without and even within our own soul, Romans chapter 7. Talk about how current this is to the day and every day, humanity. But this world, while we are living, is filled with works of the flesh. Um, I think about I look forward to heaven because that will be a place where every spiritual presence, every soul there will be in love with the Lord and following his way. Uh, That's a promise of protection and love from a God who wants to protect his children, those who've chosen his way from those who've chosen not to. That's just consistent even with God's love. And yet this world is filled with works of the flesh, people who've not chosen God's way. So let's look at very carefully the word order of verse 12. (laughs) Do not be like Cain who was of, of the evil one and murdered his brother. John did not say... John did not say that Cain became identified with Satan by or because he murdered. So let's think about this. Instead, John's style in the text certainly implies that Cain murdered because he already belonged to the evil one in his heart. John doesn't just reference what Cain did. He explained why he did it. The second half of verse 12. Because his works were evil and his brothers righteous. That was the heart from which they came forth. What made Cain's actions evil? What was about his sacrifice that was condemnable? Because it was rooted in a heart that refused to love God and follow his instruction. Think about this. Think about the condition of a person's heart who looks at the word of God and rejects his will. And then ask yourself, is the righteous path identified by Ignoring God's commands? Or is the righteous path identified by a Lord-loving heart that eagerly, zealously, joyously serves and follows his way? Just as the Old Testament was filled with accounts where God was giving uh, special prescribed instructions for whatever blessing he was offering, and they had to respond in faith to have God's power to bless that, well, the New Testament also has a God-ordained faith response. That humble hearts have no trouble with, do they? Humble hearts do not. Mark, Matthew, uh, let's see, Mark chapter 16, 16, Acts 2, 38, Galatians 3, 27, Galatians and Romans 6 are all great epistles here for this. But I often think about Luke 6, 46, when Jesus would say, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things that I say? Think about the harsh reality. He's not our Lord if we aren't doing willfully what he says and for the reasons he says to do them. John 15, 14, Jesus plainly teaches that his friends, those in his fellowship, are those who follow him and obey his commands. That's logical. John chapter 18, verse 36, he uh, teaches that his kingdom is not of this world and it will eternally thrive beyond this world. That is why we are to guard our hearts diligently so that we can maintain our fellowship in life with him eternally and be protected from the evil one who is doomed to destruction. Uh, To reference your first lesson in this series as we think about the heart and connect it to tonight, how many spouses have been physically faithful but have fueled emotional adultery because of the lust in their heart? The act may have never been done, but it was in their heart. And we know what Jesus says about that. So let's roll that way of thinking over to this. How many souls think that they're still okay with God because they have never committed the act of killing someone 
but are unremorseful in their harboring of hate in their hearts, which in God's eyes is the same because it is a sin contaminant of a heart void of God's love, God's mercy, and grace that not only kills the relationship between the two, but also between God and, and you. Just like Cain, the world rejects his love of God, God's love, and embraces hate. Now, this is a sinful hate of what is right, a hate that is equivalent to murder, which causes death and ultimately can lead to the act for sure, ultimately the death of one's own soul, because this world of evil, of Satan's kingdom and his way of thinking, his domain, hates the light. There is a stunning side note that becomes a key reminder for us, and in the form of a question, how merciful is the world's um, tolerance or behavior toward the righteous? <laughs> what a question, because there is none. It is not tolerant at all. If you engage in a word study of the first murder prompted by 1 John here and then going back to Genesis chapter 4 verse 8, you would, uh, amid the heartbreaking narrative of this tragic event, uh, you would come across definitions of Hebrew terms that paint a more graphic picture than we might first think. Cain's hate towards the righteous drove him to mutilate his brother. And think about how those of each kingdom are naturally prone to treat the others by the nature of what those kingdoms are in their heart. John doesn't want to discourage us, but we have to connect it and see reality. He wants us to be prepared. He doesn't want us to be surprised. He wants us to understand why those of the devil don't like the gospel of righteousness that you live by and you want to win them over too. Not at all. Verse 13. Do not marvel or be surprised, my brethren, if the world hates you. If the world, just like Cain hated his brother, hates you. How did Cain hate his brother? He mutilated him. Oh boy, don't be surprised if that's how the world feels towards you because of the Christ and his teachings that you embrace. Why do some abhor Christianity and want to abolish it? Simple. It serves as a reminder that they are choosing to not live righteously in submission and humbly walk before a holy God. An evil heart harbors hate and seeks to eliminate the source of whatever is pricking a guilty conscience or a seared soul. Wow. So don't be surprised when the world labels the love of God as hate because it's his love and righteousness that they hate. So all attacks by them against righteousness in their eyes are justified because the kingdom of darkness, true to its nature, lives by no righteous rule. It's certainly consistent with the doctrine that if you suffer mistreatment, if you suffer tragedy or trial, better than asking, what did I do wrong? Am I being punished for something? You better off just to say, in some cases, I must be doing something right. Because when the light of the glory of God is shining through you and reflecting off of all that you do, then it will yield the inevitable mistreatment by those who are absolutely opposed to it. We don't let that stop us, of course. But by those who prefer darkness of sin, they will not like that. They will in some way mistreat you, lie about you, persecute you in some way or another. But Philippians chapter 1 verse 28 is a great passage to encourage us. Philippians 1 28, read it on your own time now or later and see if this is not what it is saying. My rewording teaches that blatant persecution for being like Christ, obviously, proves that those people are lost and that you are saved. Now, we want everyone saved, but it proves that they're lost and you are saved. Isn't that what it's teaching? God's kingdom is stronger and has lasted ever since its establishment. And it's actually those who are part of his kingdom are part of something that will outlast this world. Not just something, it's the only thing that will outlast this world. But we still live in a world where we suffer Satan's attacks. Even though we're protected spiritually and we are uh, sealed by the Spirit, of course, uh, being His own and that God knows His people and that we are protected in that sense, eternally saved, our salvation is sure. Even with all of that and even the power to overcome temptation and maintain our spirit within and the strength thereof, no, this right here is very important to know that we are on a world, on a planet where evil can affect us and we suffer the devil's attacks. We don't like this opposition. But as his children, we can't stop living for Christ. 
We love the Lord so much. And we know that while most will reject this light, some will be attracted to it. So we are devoted to helping other people be saved and know the joys that we have also in Christ. Salvation is at stake, both of ours and of others. It's too important to not hide that light by blending in. Stand out, show the world what it needs, and it desperately needs to see the light of Christ. By contrast, let's look at this love, a love for the righteous things of life. That doesn't lead to things of hate that is equivalent to the murder of works of the flesh and nature of the darkness kingdom. Love, the presence of agape light. It's this agape love among his brethren that the world that we are told the world will know us by our treatment of one another. John 13, 35, by this all will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And think of how this carries over to how we treat those on the other kingdom. Well, those who want to kill you, how do you treat them? Matthew 5, 34, uh, 43 through 48. You have heard it was said that you shall love your enemies. Um, let me reword this for sake of emphasis. You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you and do good to those who hate you and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Well, that's certainly different than the way the world uh, treats itself, um, isn't it? Verse 45, that you may be sons of your father in heaven. The phrase son of or father of in different cases referring to deity or spiritual uh, matters means nature of, son of, nature of. The child takes on the character traits of the father and that is the case spiritually, his heart of love. How does God, then let's ask the question, how does God manifest his benevolent mercy and love over the whole earth while it currently holds the citizens of both kingdoms? <laughs> For he, the verse continues, for he makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends the rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? Therefore, Matthew 5, 48, you shall be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. So after all of this study, Let's ask the question, what kingdom are you in? What kingdom are you in? One that's identified by this hate and murder? Or are you identified by one of love for righteousness and selfless service to your brethren for the greater good of all? The kingdom of the tares, which will be sifted and burned, or the kingdom of wheat, suitable for the king? The kingdom of flesh and carnality, marked by hate and all that is of good, or all that is, you know, hate of towards all that is, or the kingdom of the spirit in Christianity characterized by God himself? Good questions. In transition with a similar approach, let's now look at the second section of this outline and of this topic tonight. We won't be able to spend as much time as I wish we could, but let's ask some questions that I think will get the point across. What influence are you under? As we think about the work of the flesh of drunkenness, what influence are you under? A better question, perhaps. What are you filled with? We've all heard well-intentioned sermons against drunkenness, and they all essentially say the same thing. Don't have anything to do with intoxication. And even amid all of the uh, arguments from every side, and there are more than two, uh, amid all of the poor logic from people on each side sometimes, and amid all of the misapplied verses so often, even through all of that, I do favor the conclusion that I just stated. <laughs> I, I do think that the church needs good, and I mean accurate, sincere, spiritual education on this matter, because the act of consuming or consuming an intoxicated beverage becomes a spiritual discussion for the Christian about a carnal practice. Yeah, and I can't help but think about Romans 8 verse 5. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. No wonder the minds of the flesh and the minds of the Spirit collide here, and like gasoline to the fire is when faulty teaching and poor reasoning from people on varying views. Uh, this format and the lesson, of course, in this series is not suitable for giving a 
two-hour theological defense against the consumption of alcohol. So for those of you who want to be well-informed on this matter, I strongly encourage you to extend the blessing of our time together in this study to search out, and I normally don't do this, but to search out the three audio outline studies that I will specifically mention and guide you on the screen. It was on the Brownsburg Church of Christ website, the B B U R G Church of Christ.org website, that I found these lessons from 2011 and 2013. And it is, they, they are the most fair, factual, um, honest, and spiritual approach to this subject I have ever seen. So I encourage you to visit the website, click on the audio video sermons there, and type the key word alcohol. And you'll see these lessons, the bottom three particularly, pop up. And the far right icons will show you the access of the PDF study along the way as you listen to the sermon. And I know you'll be blessed by that. But even as I suggest this, I realize that I just read Romans 8, 5, where it says that the mind of the flesh and the mind of the spirit think their own way. It's very likely that those hearing this suggestion of further study will then say, I know what I believe, so I don't need to check out any further. Or even I know what the scriptures say, so I don't need to study any further. Brethren... Um, huh, please intend to extend your study on this matter because most people won't. Uh, we've learned that if it's one thing we've learned, people will do whatever they want to do. And such is a mindset of the world, isn't it? And additionally, uh, Bible study can be very dangerous if you look for what you want to find. And if you approach the Holy Scriptures with a carnal mind, it's contrary to its intent. So it's actually not hard to find and to read verses describing God's view of the process toward the state of being drunk, towards the process of and the state of being drunk. As you can imagine, it's not very good. It doesn't paint it in a good light at all. In fact, it's very, very bad. The hard part is choosing on the front end and up on the back end to conclude or to both hear and heed the inspired intent and instruction just from passages like these Proverbs, and for sake of time, I will not read them, though I sure wanted to. But Proverbs 23, 29 through 35, and Proverbs 31, 4 through 7. Proverbs 20, verse 1, Proverbs 22, verse 10, cannot be read by someone of a spiritual mind and say, I can't wait to do this, even though it will harm or potentially danger my alertness and focus for the cause of Christ. Maybe... As we said earlier, people do what they want to do. Maybe it's not as complicated of an issue if people have made it because that's the issue. A better question, a question for us then is, do you choose to subject your thoughts and behaviors to the toxins in worldly spirits? Well, that's a good question. The mind focused on spiritual fortitude simply doesn't entertain the thought of consenting to the process of carnal sedation that can invite potential or spiritual demise and destruction. So a better question in all such matters is what do we prioritize? Who and what are we living for? And I know that's a different way of thinking than the world does, but we need to be different than the world. I don't expect the lost world to think and behave like the saved. I am distraught, however, when I see Christians um, stunting their spiritual growth and their walk in the light by thinking and behaving in ways that are like they still need to be introduced to the Savior and be exited from the world of darkness. Luke chapter 21 verse 34 says, But take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing and drunkenness and the cares of life, and that day come on you unexpectedly. Prioritizing God's way over your will is the key. And what is God's purpose for our life? What's the primary purpose for um, the spirit over the lives of the Christians, those who've been redeemed? Romans chapter 8, not verse 28. That's the promise that's conditional based on verse 29. The salvation we have, the spirit's primary function for the saved are those who wants to be molded into the image of Christ. The Spirit wants to daily, continually, as we walk in the light, aid us in the spiritual development as we actively yield to His influence and His Word and teachings. And I prefer to maintain that spiritual high. I prefer to stay focused so that I never harm my body nor lower my spiritual guard against the enemy. And the question to us is, 
Do we, do you, surrender your body, mind, and soul to be filled and keenly guided by the Holy Spirit? And if you do, then that's the key. Christians can be known by their conduct. We can know that God's Spirit is abiding with our souls by the inward development of this character's trait of the fruit within us, the spiritual fruit of the character traits. Not just the people that we bring to Christ, but the spiritual fruit that grows within us is the character that we become, how we act, how we behave, how we think, and how we react. Act. By our conduct, people will know whose influence we are under. I grew up hearing preachers quote Ephesians 5, 17 very often, but sadly, rarely for its main purpose. Paul says, therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk, neither the destination nor the process. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Now, this direct passage can certainly be used to talk about uh, the graphic portrayal of how God thinks about sin of drunkenness and the willful journey toward the state. But I'm intrigued when this is anyone's main focus of that particular verse because in this passage, that's not Paul's emphasis. Paul is playing a word game to compare and contrast the behavioral differences based on what you are filled with. Paul's readers, just like us, can relate to this illustration, either by first-hand experience or by observation. So we understand the effects of drunkenness and know why God tells Timothy chapter 2, verse 12, by inspiration, to live soberly, righteously, and godly. So what is Paul's main emphasis in Ephesians 5, 17? It's this, just as being a body being intoxicated will produce observable, unfitting changes in behavior. Likewise, the Holy Spirit taking up residence in the, the heart of the Christian will also produce evident, becoming changes in your behavior. Sometimes uh, we can just look at people and think there's something different about them. There's something divinely different. They don't think the same. People will look at you as a Christian. You don't think the same. You don't behave the same. And that's the point of comparison. Let's look at these contrasts. From the verses that you've already heard much about in this series, Galatians 5, 19 through 20, when one rejects the Holy Spirit's guidance of truth, they, uh, their mind is filled with toxins of sinful passions, and that's the path that they pursue regardless of what it is. This leads to all kinds of things like slander, anger, deceit, greed, envy, lust, idolatry, impurity, factions, jealousies, malice, rage, selfishness, ambition, filthy language, debauchery, sexual immorality, murder, and that's not even it. Every evil thing. Those are things that the Christian has nothing to do with, no identity or fellowship with. Galatians 5.24 says, though, and we've just been taught, that those who desire or belong to Christ have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. So by contrast, being under the influence of the Holy Spirit's word and presence, instructed by the word, tempered by prayer, and trained through life, will produce godly changes in behavior. And what are those changes? The Bible calls these divine character traits a fruit, spiritual produce of the soul and a production result of the very Spirit of God. And extra verses for you to study along those lines. And since next week in your series officially starts the shifted focus onto these fruit of the Spirit, let's let this lesson conclude by a preview of what is to come. In Galatians 5, we just learned that the nine traits listed here are um, to the Christian who is mutually dwelling with God. Enjoy those extra verses listed for you. But those who practice the works of the flesh are not in the kingdom. They don't partake of the blessings in the kingdom. And Galatians 5.22, Galatians 5.22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. You have a lot of great topics to look forward to in this series. He says, against such there is no law. Drink as much of the Holy Spirit as possible. And we understand the context. Get into the spiritual life and give it your all. And those who are in Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Verse 25, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. So again, we ask the question, which kingdom are you in? Which kingdom rules your heart? The kingdom of the tares, which is going to be sifted and burned, or the kingdom of wheat, which is suitable for the king and saving? Uh, the kingdom of flesh and carnality, marked by pride and hate, welcoming debauchery in all of its forms, encouraging it, 
uh, slacking in righteousness, the kingdom or of spirit and Christianity, which is characterized by love and joy and benevolence and mercy and respect, spiritual fortitude and of a sound mind secured, always, always walking circumspectly with every step, wanting to be found in right standing. As you see, we've discussed a lot tonight in these two subjects. We could spend a lot more time I always wish we had more time. But I think that we've conveyed these points tonight. And if you're looking at this lineup, next week starts the contrast indeed, where you begin to look at the fruit of the Spirit, putting away those works of the flesh. Thank you for this time that we've spent together. I hope it's been a blessing to you. And I know it has been a blessing for me. And I look forward to the next invitation, Lord willing, and maybe seeing you in person next time. Have a great night living for the Lord.